I have this great store in uh, where I live now in Fredericksburg, uh, which is uh, about 75 miles west of here. And these guys, are, we're, we're just trying to help people stop smoking. And they have top-notch liquids. They don't have any, any bullshit, no, you know, no synthetic yeah. stuff, only true nicotine. Really, I got this vape, which has, uh, it, the coil runs an alternating current. So it, it kind of vibrates and you can set the frequency. So it's really do, do you, <laughs> high tech shit. Are you old school with like tobacco flavor or do you have some mm -hmm. like, you really, you, that's proper old school because I have, I always have like a st yeah. strawberry yogurt. <laughs> uh, okay. <laughs> okay. Okay. Brit boy. I did start. You're in Texas here, man. We, we stick tobacco in our lip. <laughs> I actually stopped. I went on holiday to the Caribbean with the kids. We had a two week holiday. I took a four day supply said to the kids, after four days, I'm going to stop. And I was dreading that day. And then one day I went in the sea with one in my pocket. Yeah. Like, so then I was down to a three-day Oh, no. I stopped <laughs> dead. I didn't vape for 10 days. Uh -huh. uh, we flew to Miami. The kids flew home. Mm -hmm. I flew to Texas. I got off the plane. I went straight. Straight to, to the vape shop. No, was, I, I went straight. I, no, actually, I, I, there was a, a garage uh, next to my hotel. I went in there to get a coffee. Mm -hmm. and, you there, that, and there it was, calling your name. I know it was. But you have those, Peter, Peter, <laughs> suck on me. Because you have this vanilla bean coffee here, which we, we don't do in the UK, which is to, totally gross. But what I'm do like, you mean, the little bean coffee? The vanilla bean. They, they, you know, you get it at the garage, you, you just pour it yourself. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, mm -hmm. I, and for some reason, I love that stuff. And I got it, and I went to the counter, and there was literally a vape looking at me. I was like, oh, fuck it. I'm going <laughs> to have one with my coffee, <laughs> just the one. And then, uh, yeah, what was that, eight months ago? Yeah, at least. This, this is the one you want. That's the good one. Jesus. Oh, that's the good stuff. They're weapons. No, this is, that's the, is that THC? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. That's... Oh, D Danny would have some of that. <laughs> Go Danny. Pretty early. I can't, I can't smoke weed. It sends me, it sends me in the funny place. Did it work? Oh yeah. yeah. We did. Uh, functions. <laughs> we did try mushrooms for our first time on this trip. Yeah. Well, my first time. How was it? I I loved it because someone because my wife used to do mushrooms and you know when she was much younger, and she said we dad we need to do mushrooms, and so someone gave me actually my drug dealer who I just met before I came in, uh, <laughs> he uh, he gave me these micro dose like gummies, um, uh, which are you know, cybacillin gummies. And I tried one, nothing. I tried two, three, four, five, complete nothing. So now I have to go and get the real mushroom. Well, so I, I have a history with drugs, uh, so I keep away from them now. And mm -hmm. I'm uh, eight years sober because I, I got in a bad way with it. Uh, so uh, one of our friends here was like, well, you got to try mushrooms. I was like, oh, I'm not sure. I, I, Danny, was, Danny was with me, which was good because I was – nervous about it because you know you hear about what they're like i'd be very nervous I'm, i am nervous about doing mushrooms strangely enough <laughs> well I, th I thought it would send me into a, a weird place because I, yeah. I i i just know what my mind can do and mm -hmm. um, luckily that it was like a retreat the, the the friend who took us um uh his partner uh she, she did a whole kind of session with us calming us down relaxing us mm -hmm. telling us we're in a safe place and everything uh did it and yes yeah, it, it was an amazing experience completely superficial for me it was cliche sh colors and shapes because i didn't know what to expect when people mm -hmm. talk about hallucinating i thought do you have your eyes open and like just see little green men and shit it wasn't mm -hmm. like that it, it was definitely when you go to the toilet the wall would kind of like that sounds a bit like dmt yeah which i've done twice and, right and enjoyed very much because it fucking ended yeah i love when it just oh 30 minutes you're done this was about 90 minutes, but what? That's but it good. went quick. Mm -hmm. But what would happen is you, I would go from seeing these colors to then going into like a, a trance-like dream. Um, and, then I'd real, and then I'd realize <laughs> I'm dreaming and snap out of it. Mm -hmm. And I had like three of these different dreams. One of them uh, were, <laughs> it's, so, it's so dumb. Uh, I, I got up from the bed we were on and I went to the door and Kanye West was there and he told us, he was like... As it happens. As it happened, he was like, what are you doing in my Airbnb? And I was like, I was like, dude, I'm, I'm tripping, you need to fuck off. So then I went and laid back down. And then, but I didn't actually get up. And then no, I, 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 I snapped out of it. I was like, ha. Huh. And so now I've done it, I understand what it is. Right. And I think I'll do it again. Do it again? Yeah, mm -hmm. I, think, I think I just want to go a little bit deeper. Mm -hmm. But Danny... You happy to talk about it? Yeah, I mean, I, I had a complete like Pete was seeing Kanye West, and I had a really like introspective 
ask myself some tough questions. I, I loved it. I oh. definitely, definitely do it. Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm going to do it. I mean, I've been smoking weed since I was 13. You know, I grew up in Amsterdam, so this is a part of my life. It's right. part of who I am. I microdose my way all the way through everything. I, 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 I can't just, smoke weed. Just, no. No. no I, I, whenever I smoke weed, I like it. I enjoy the ritual. I mean, I used to enjoy the ritual. The ritual is great, yeah. But whenever I get stoned, I just get super paranoid. I just don't enjoy it. Then you should not yeah, do it's, it. It's not for me. I'm, no. I'm a... No, I'm really just an alcohol person now, but um, mm -hmm. a bit of whiskey. We've got whiskey up there, by the way. It's a bit early for that, isn't it? It's 10 a.m. Actually, we did that. <laughs> That's before. a bit <laughs> early for me. A little bit early. Yeah. yeah, so this band here, they're called The Ghost Inside. They're from L.A. Um, they're a screaming hardcore metal band, and they're one. most of these bands struggle. They spend their entire career sharing a little minibus, driving around, no making shit. enough money from show to show. I know it well. Well, they're one of the few that broke out. And when they released uh, their, I think it was like their fourth album, it went to something like number 30 in the Billboard. But for a band that side, that's in incredible. That's really, that is quite incredible. So they go on tour. Uh, they leave, they're, they're in Lubbock, Lubbock, Texas. Yeah. They set off for the next one, middle of the night. The bus hits an 18-wheeler head on. The oh driver goodness. of the bu bu both was killed. Uh, the drummer lost his leg. The singer was in a coma for a month. Holy they shit. Were all, and they were ripped to shreds. Some of them, they were in hospital for ages. They spent four years in rehab. And the drummer figured out, his dad figured out a way of, of making a drum kit with one leg. That's kind of a Def Leppard story, except it is. with the arm. Yeah. Well, so I know I, Rick Witt very well, Savage. I think he reached out to... Uh, I think he reached out to him to oh, like send his support. Mm -hmm, yeah, mm -hmm. um, he had a few people reach out to him actually. Um, but they figured out this drum kit. Uh, they had a thing called the hammer, so mm -hmm. his stump could hit it and, and hit a double. And he's a double bass drummer. Sure, yeah, so, speed metal is what you want. Yeah. So they did that. It's like a trigger. A yeah, trigger. a trigger. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah they had a trigger. That's exactly what Rick did with Triggers. lasers. Yeah. Oh, with no, we didn't have. Then it was just he just had to hit the pads and stuff. They um, and then they figured a way of getting the whole like the band to be start playing again. And they're like, can we do a show? And so they spent four years trying to get back together and they eventually booked the shrine in LA, which I think holds about 3,000. big, that's big, yeah. Sold out in two minutes. So what they did is they moved out to the car park, again, sold all the rest of the tickets and they came out and they paid a show for 8,000 people. <sighs> and I was like, I don't know what it was. I was like, I need to be at this show. Uh -huh. So I just booked a flight, went out, did some interviews, went to the show. And then afterwards, my friend Tom, he reached out to them and said, like, Pete loves your story. Can you make a make a show about it? So we made a four-part podcast about it. Oh, really? Uh, and it's a really just un unbelievable story what they went through. And you got to send me a link to that. I'm yeah, we'll, we'll send you that. Yeah. They're, um, but they're back touring. But they're playing. So Brixton, what we were talking about, mm -hmm. they're playing Brixton. They booked Brixton. So this is what was unfair for them. They got back. They played that show, ready to tour. COVID hits. Oh, Everything course, shuts yeah. down. Yeah. So the, they had the Brixton show booked. That got put back, got put back again, but they're, it's on this June. So they're playing this June, and then they're, I think they're headlining the second stage at Donington. And, uh, so God, Donington. One time. It was nice. You went? Mm -hmm. Which one? Oh, fuck. Remember anyone who played? No. I, I, if, if you remember Donington, is, did you do it right? Um, so, so I went, there was one year I went, I, went, I had the Reading Festival booked, and then they booked Donington the same weekend. And now I was really into this band called Biohazard, and they were playing Donington. So I was like, well, mm -hmm. I've got to fucking be there. So I was at the Ready. Got the Why do I think Iron Maiden was there? I mean, they played a lot of Yeah. Them. I think it was Kiss headlined this one. Mm. No, it was Aerosmith. It was Aerosmith. Mm -hmm. So I got the bus from Reading to Donington. Holy. Did the uh, Donington show and, and came back. And that was the year I think it was Pantera played and Slay. No, Sepultura. Anyway. Mm -hmm. But yeah, so this band, they're playing Brixton in June, and uh, I'm going to go with my daughter. Well, you're quite the fan, obviously. Yeah, you, yeah. You marked yourself with them, so. Yeah, one of the, the bassists might even be listening to this. Uh, Jim Riley, he's a good guy. Mm -hmm. he's, uh, anyway, how are you doing, man? Good to see you. I'm, I'm doing good. Are, is this not, are we, have we started? I mean, we started 10 minutes ago. <laughs> I've divulged all, welcome back to Texas, brother. Thank how you. about that? Welcome back. Thank you. You're doing it right. You got the, you're real, you're real Texas. You've got the California plate Mustang in yep. the driveway. We got that. Which shows your dickhead. I mean, that's yep. what we think here when we're in Austin. Like, oh, another California. Yep. I love it. Because <laughs> we don't get muscle cars like that in the UK. Actually, there is a Mustang in the UK now, but it's, it's not the same. Have you seen the new Corvette, the mid-engine Corvette? Yeah, it's ridiculous. <laughs> <laughs> it's ridiculous. My wife's like flying car before you get that. <laughs> Dude, that car. This, this is Danny's first time to Texas. Uh huh. First time in Austin. Enjoying? 
Loving it, yeah. yeah. Cool. I still, I still haven't got my bearings. Have you just been in the Airbnb the whole time? Pretty much. <laughs> <laughs> no, we, we, we've been to dinner. We've been to Three Forks a couple of times. Yeah. I okay. Had a steak. All right. Where else should we on Saturday? Uh, did we have barbecues the other week? No, that that restaurant I went to. Remind me. Walk me back. Who was there? With Dan and Darren and. Oh God, um, Eddie V's. Eddie V. Well, yeah, they're good. Eddie V's. If you like that that kind of restaurant, I'd recommend True Lux. Okay. Um, in fact, a lot of uh, Eddie V's guys went to True Lux. Or maybe it was the other way around. I can't remember. Um, but uh, that's kind of it's in that in that general neighborhood. But you know, really, we have so many cool little places all around. South Congress has changed very much, probably since the last time you were here. I mean, it's, now we have Soho House and other bull crap. Yeah. Which is unfortunate. We yeah. left. My wife and I left uh, about eight or nine months ago, um, we decided, you know, it was, we were in Southeast Austin. We liked it very much, but man, we went through some shit here. First of all, with COVID, mm -hmm. they let all the homeless were everywhere. This already started before that. There was just no direction for the city. Um, and then uh, we had this, our snowmageddon here where we lost, uh, lost, power. Uh, lost power and we were out for five days. What was interesting is uh, I-35 divides East and West Austin. And, you know, there's a lot of what we call Section 8 housing in East Austin, also near where we were, even though we had a new home. Um, and that's, you know, for uh, poor people. Yeah. Working poor, really. And um, the first electricity to get turned off was all the Section 8 housing, including ours, were on the same, same segment. And you could literally see the glow of the west side while the east side was turned off. It was very obvious what was going on. Sounds a little bit like what happened in New Orleans. It probably happens everywhere, yeah. if you think about it. And, you know, we said, eh, I'm 57, my wife's the same age. Like, let's go out. And this is wonderful town called Fredericksburg, which is about 80 miles from here, west. Very famous. If, you, if you're going to get married, <laughs> that's a good place. Or it was where we have the, hen, the hens parties. Yeah. Um, but it's real old school. You know, we have butchers, bakers, et cetera. And we're pretty much off the grid. I mean, we do get electricity from uh, from uh, the central uh, electric co-op, but we have our own whole house generator. I was just explaining. I'm building a gasifier, mm -hmm. um, and a gasifier. This was big in the in the Great Depression, where with wood in a in a furnace, and you kind of have a furnace and a number of tubes, and then out the other end, and you just put wood in this furnace or anything else. You know, zombies, anything they'll burn. <laughs> um, out comes something called syngas. And you can literally put that right into the carburetor of, uh, of a gas-powered engine, and it will run. Wow. So propane right now is $3. It just went up to $3.20 a gallon. That's, it's getting, I mean, for us, okay, we can afford it, but it's really expensive. What if it just becomes unavailable? I have a lot of wood. And I can just keep throwing my wood in, and everything will function. We have a well. We have an aerobic septic system, which basically works just like a, um, a water cleaning facility. So out the other end shoots literally from sprays all over my garden, clean water after I've done all my business. So it's, it's, I'm ready. Are you off grid? <laughs> and I, and I have an S9, uh, minor. I was going to say, <laughs> sounds like, sounds like you're off grid. Pretty much. Wow. Or at least ready for it. I ready. like, I like having you're the prepped. grid. It's there. And there's some cool guys uh, who run this outfit called next stream, uh, which is, they're a wireless ISP. They also have 400 miles of dark fiber all around the hill country. Their own interconnects. They don't do anything with any of the other backhaul guys. Um, and so they're, they're connecting me up to, up to fiber with the backup of the, the wireless uh, internet service provider. So we should be good. Have you got, have you got bullets? And have oh, you got, dude. Have, dude. You, you remember, I'm from the UK. Mm -hmm. Like yeah. we defend ourselves with a fork and a spoon. Yeah, I've... I, I remember when Bobby's just had a, a stick. <laughs> That's not that way anymore in the, uh, in London. I've only shot a gun three times. Oh, dude! Well, if you had time, you know, we can we can always hook up because there's so much to do when it comes to that in Texas. Uh, but yeah, um, now I've never owned a gun before. I lived in Texas. Right. Um, it's really a part of our life, mm -hmm. and you know, obviously that can be used for for food supply would be probably my main reason, but you don't know when the zombie apocalypse comes. So yeah, um, even my wife also has a, a handgun. Uh, we carry them in the car. I don't, I don't carry on my person. You, you can legally here. That's, uh, it's not for me. It yeah, feels I, like I probably get in a rage. <laughs> I think I'd be one of those, if I, if I got one, I'd get 
20. Well, this is the problem. They're really cool. Yeah. And you go out shooting with your buddies. I'm not a hunter either. I don't like killing stuff. Uh, and it's like, oh, let me see this. Oh, I got an AR pistol. Oh, I got this. And yeah, it, it's uh, because they're like reasonably affordable in the couple hundred dollar range. You can get something pretty nice. Yeah, it becomes, uh, it becomes fun. It it's, really does. It's, it's become a topic that we talk about on the show because obviously I come out to Texas a lot. I come out to the US a lot. And if I lived here, I would absolutely get a gun. I, I have no issue with them. Yeah. But I would never want to change the laws in the UK. I, you know, if there was a referendum on bringing it, in guns, it, I, I would just be against it's it. It's not the culture. You, yeah. It's, it, it's, all, it's as stupid personally to me as Austin um, implementing bike paths. <laughs> this is, I mean, I grew up in Amsterdam. So, yeah. you know, the, the bicycle traffic is very integrated with everything else and it flows, you know, and people don't even pay it. People are driving, you know, riding without their hands on the handlebar with the dog trotting next to them, with the kid on the back, kid on the front, you know, grocery baskets uh, on the cell phone. They can do anything and it just, it works. But that's hundreds of years of, uh, of integration of that traffic. You can't just say, here's a line, car, don't cross it, bikes, you're good to go, and then have the bicyclists act like they're, like they're God. No, I mean, this is, uh, it's just as stupid. You can't, you can't do that. And pro but probably more people will die in Austin on their bike than people would die in the UK of gunshot, yeah. probably. Because, you know, you guys got knives. You're big on sticking each other. Yeah, but you know That's what? That's a cool thing. Like, <laughs> fuck, you, I'm going to stick you, motherfucker. That knife thing, like, people talk about talk about that they say well you need guns because you have the knife crime but the knife crime really is is predominantly gang crime of course yeah but it, what do you think gun crime is I yeah mean, but 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 i think there's a slight difference in here and someone can lose their shit and you know in certain scenarios go out and shoot people shoot themselves shoot their family that's what always makes the news yeah but you know there's lots of stuff that happens when someone loses their shit and they kill people one way or the other no of course but what i'm saying is is, is like I, yeah, you know, if anyone said to me there's a no-go zone in London, I, I mm. still I'd probably say, say oh, no, I'd probably go there. I'm, I'm, I, I don't feel like we have those places you can't go, mm -hmm. and you very rarely, very rarely hear about uh, an innocent person being stabbed. So it's, to me, it's not a, a reason to bring in guns as some people think we should. But you know. but see, the real the real thing about the USA and guns is what you're seeing right now. There are limitations to what our government will do. Mm -hmm. They're just, they are afraid of us and they should be. And that's the ultimate point. We had Cody Wilson on recently. Mm -hmm. He made a really interesting point with this. The 3D gun guy. Yeah, 3D gun guy. Uh, Which he's now he's, doing more, but. He's, he's, he's a really, really smart guy, real deep mm -hmm. thinker, really liked him. He's, a, he's all about the First Amendment. He is, but he, he, he said, you know, a lot of people talk about guns in the US and I won't get him exactly right, but he says, you know, there's a chance to, yeah, uh, to defend itself against the government. But he said, we had the chance in COVID and it didn't happen. Correct. Um, and I think you still need to push the American people to a certain point. Um, and it's, it just, it still remains. No country will invade us for this very reason. I mm. mean, it's, it's, it, would, it would be crazy. Um, it's, it's kind of interesting to see now with Ukraine where, you know, we literally, America is dumping guns you know, in big crates, which of course is mainly being picked up by gangs. And let's make no mistake what Ukraine is, because, you know, I grew up in Europe. We all know what comes from Ukraine. We all know what's going on there. Not to say that there aren't lovely people, of course, it's the same everywhere. But now you have this, look at them, they're defending their own country with guns, yet America, get rid of your guns. You know, it's, it's a very weird type of hypocrisy. I think it's, the other thing is the U.S. has this kind of split culture, like a very or divided incredibly culture. split right now in yeah. many directions. Yeah. And it's when I go to LA or New York, it's a very different experience when I go to Texas or you know, Florida uh, or Wyoming. But, and I, it, and I think the, there's, there's very few things which are similar apart from <laughs> the accent maybe um, and, and the language, but they're very different. I, I feel like it's very uh, European when, you're in New York and LA, and when you're here, it's very traditional American culture. But mm -hmm. but I, I like each for different reasons. Mm -hmm. But it's when they, I think it's different cultures trying to assert their cultures between states, and that doesn't work. It's a bit like trying to uh, exert a, a certain culture internationally, trying to force democracy in the Middle East when it's not ready. I th you always see these failures of exerting cultures from one group to another it just never works well this is the globalist agenda yeah the globalist agenda is to i mean look at what happened to europe in the past 20 years they have just pushed migrants into europe 
uh, and that has created incredible. The Netherlands was the friendliest, most open place ever. Now, uh, my daughter couldn't hold hands with her partner walking past certain streets of Rotterdam. Really? Yes, because they would spit on her because it was two girls holding a hand. Right, okay. And, okay. you know, yeah. this was not possible. You couldn't think of this happening in the Netherlands. But this is all the globalist agenda. Let's let's just push everyone together, force everybody, then use identity politics to um, create what is now called equity. So... You know, we have a ranking system no longer based on merit, the, the traditional meritocracy. And this is very prevalent here now in the United States. I went down, I went into... And uh, it's bad. It's very, very bad. Yeah. It, it, I also think it's, it's kind of tricky because I, I totally see what you're saying about your daughter. It's, it's, it's terrible as well. But I, I live in the UK, not only the UK, Bedford, and it's... Bedford is one of the most multicultural places in mm-hmm. the UK. And, and the UK is very multicultural. And there's been a... There's been a lot of upside to that, a lot of good sides to that. Sure. I haven't seen a, I have not seen any issues with uh, the only issue I saw in Bedford uh, with a big push when we became part of the EU and there was there was like free movement of people in the EU. Mm-hmm. It put a lot of pressure on traditional um, jobs like electricians and plumbers because people coming from Eastern Europe could charge a lot less. Yep. But there was also a thing where the service got raised up because. Um, what you had is people coming in with, at a lower price, willing to work longer hours. There's, there's a history of, you know, especially with like builders in the UK, you know, you know, traditionally having poor service, not knowing who you could deal with. So well, we have put, to break for some builders' tea. Well, yeah, but we, <laughs> it, it was like it was. I think I think overall it it was a good it was a good thing. It mm-hmm. it actually did benefit. But I I went to Turkey during the migrant crisis where basically Erdogan was fed up because. Four and a half million migrants. Yeah, and he sent everybody on. He sent everyone mm-hmm. to the border. You know, he felt that Europe, Europe should deal with it. And I, um, I essentially smuggled myself into a migrant camp. Mm-hmm. Went around, spoke to a lot of different people, and I felt it was tricky because uh, not only had I met economic migrants who had left Africa because there was no opportunity, but mm-hmm. also there were migrants leaving Afghanistan and Syria. They come across the border from Syria because they're in a fucking war zone. Mm-hmm. So I empathized with what they were trying to do. Mm-hmm. But I also then was empathizing with the people on the Greek side where they were seeing kind of destruction of properties and vineyards on the border. And I, I, I felt like if you're going to uh, if you're going to bring migrants in, you need an integration plan. And and that hadn't been dealt with in, in the right way. Well, exactly. <clears throat> I think I'm, I'm all for people seeking their fortune in other countries. I've done it myself multiple times, multiple countries. I'm all for people coming to the United States, seeking their fortune for what, we, what I still consider the American dream. And if you work just as hard, but that's kind of the problem here, is that we're, exactly what you were saying. Um, we're now to a level in the United States where it doesn't really matter if you work just as hard, you will advance because of your identity. You will advance because of your skin color, because of your religion, because of your sexuality. This is this is not the concept here. Uh, and then when you when people are forced, you have to have a. I mean, I know all about the migrant camps in the Netherlands. It's a mess. Mm-hmm. It just really doesn't make the world stage. But it, it it creates and you're putting people in camps. This this is not integration. You're ghettoizing parts of cities. This is not integration. Yeah. Um, but you know, that's, that's, that is the agenda right now. The agenda is global. It's our border, you I mean, you can walk right across, you can come right in. Um, I think it's not 2 million people in the, in, in the last year. That's a lot of people who just come in and, you know, somehow get swallowed into whatever in the economy or maybe into social services. But you know. why, why do you think this agenda exists? What, what, what is because they don't care about us, and they would like more of us to die. As far as I'm concerned, they just don't give a shit. Is it, lib- is it liberal policies that don't consider the consequences? That's the tool. That's just the tool. Yeah. Uh, this is, to me, everything is financial. Everything that's going on we're seeing now, everything is financial. We have a war. We're distracted by the kinetics on the ground in Ukraine because that's what we're being shown and programmed with. You know, If, if we showed Somali children being killed all day, I think... I think we would feel the same way and we'd be just as upset or Haitian children or Yemenese children, or yeah. I can go on and on and on, but that's not the programming right now. And um, uh, lots of things are happening while this is taking place. 
you know, there's still all kinds of vaccination passport things being set up. There's still all kinds of, you know, data being kind of not reported on of things that maybe should be known to the general public, certainly with uh, big pharma. And um, what is really going on is a networks war because we, we, the whole world is now networked. So um, Russia, you're canceled and you're canceled from all the financials, not all, but I'm generalizing. Isn't it incredible that a whole country can be canceled? I went on Google Maps this morning and it just said 404 <laughs> not found in that whole area of, uh, <laughs> of Russia. Um, we really need to, to look closely what's going on. So if Russia pulls out of Ukraine, does SWIFT get turned on again for them? I'll bet you that's not in the plan. Um, now, Russia has their own networks. They have gas pipelines, which coincidentally go through Ukraine. You wonder if that has anything to do with it at all. Um, they, could, they can turn stuff off. They can reverse the flow. They can do all kinds of things. We have social networks we can get kicked off of. Uh, we have, um, uh, uh, I mean, so energy, electricity, because energy and electricity are all two separate kind of networks. All of these networks, and, and we really don't control any of them. So today, Elon Musk is giving away free charging to everyone in a Tesla uh, who needs it in the Ukraine region. Um, tomorrow, he could turn them off in Russia. He could literally turn off the Tesla so they don't run. Mm -hmm. This is the problem. So you know, when, some, when we say Bitcoin fixes this, that's exactly, it, it, it's now so clear. It is the only uh, non-corruptible network. It is the only one you can really completely trust because of the verification. And we, you know, that does give you a, a trust, even though we're not supposed to trust, but you, you see it right there on the blockchain. You can, you can check it by your own rules, everything. That's really the only thing we have going for us because everything else is under someone else's control. Um, and of course there's activity pub and there's some other things that are growing quite nicely uh, on the internet that circumvent all of this. Well, Danny, you made the point earlier that the most interesting part of the Ukraine-Russia war with regards to Bitcoin. It works for both sides. It's crazy. Yeah. So It does. Of course it does. And, and, it, and as it should. But it's so powerful that it's got like, I mean, we all knew it had no political alliance, but now everyone knows that there's like, there's no politics in Bitcoin. It's for mm -hmm. everyone. And I think that's so cool. We have, uh, you know, it was something I wanted to talk to you about is uh, truth finding. Because whether you, uh, we had Scott Horton on the other day to talk about it. Mm -hmm. Very anti-war very anti-American globalist policies. Uh, and someone that's very hard to fact check live because he's he's a brain dump of information and history. Mm -hmm. And the show goes out and hundreds of great comments on YouTube. Thank you, thank you for having me on. But also people coming back and saying, look, you need to be careful with Scott. You know, you can't blame everything and and uh, 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 on, on international policies, yada, yada. And uh, I think, as somebody who's very quick to, to jump to an opinion on things, uh, I kind of came to this recent conclusion on it all, is actually both sides are bad. And you know what's great is the Ukrainians suffering, we can send them Bitcoin. And the Russians who are suffering, we can send them Bitcoin. <laughs> and that, that's the most important thing because all this bullshit is controlled by a few psychopaths mm -hmm. and hundreds of millions of people are suffering. And us as the people who understand and support Bitcoin, we can just help them out. And that's... it's. I think that's one of the most interesting things that's happened over the last two years. Whatever big story is out there, whether it's inflation, whether it's uh, a, dollar, uh, a dollarized country trying to protect themselves, whether it's Canadian truckers trying to protest, whether it's uh, a country under attack or a country, a country being the aggressor and, mm -hmm. and then being cancelled, there is a Bitcoin angle to every single major global story now. There is. There is. Um, now, Bitcoin is not big enough for the global oil markets. Yet. Or the global, not exactly, not yet. Um, it was very interesting to see. For again, the financial system is broken. That's so obvious to me. I mean, just look at it. Inflation is at seven point nine percent. You know, the ten-year bond yield is you know two percent. The lowest possible inflation rate. We oh yeah, know with, with total horse crap, total bull crap numbers. They change all the time. Well, instead of steak, you're just eating ground uh, chuck, you know, <laughs> so, and it's the same price. Go figure. You're just as good. But no, we've seen these events and, and I'm very, very skeptical about the severity of COVID. Um, uh, not, and, you know, I just got to speak this way and just take the human element out of it. I'm very, a very compassionate man, but you know, people who died, yes, a lot of people died. 
A lot of people die. I think the severity of where certain measures were taken to is, uh, was a part of keeping the economy as closed as possible. Uh, because of the balance sheet issues the federal, all central banks have. They're in a real, real deep problem, and now they don't trust each other. That's what, and I, I'm not an expert on it, but I, I really tried to do as much understanding as I can of how it works with these reverse repo markets, which used to be, if you went to the, to the Fed discount window, is what we called it, that was a shame, and your bank was shamed for that. Now it's not just an overnight loan of you know, 100 or 200 or $700 billion dollars, now it's you know two weeks or a month, and so there's clearly something wrong, and um, it is my opinion that they need to keep slowing down the economy without raising interest rates. They're going to have to, I think, tomorrow, whatever they're going to raise something, because um, otherwise the whole thing just kind of falls apart. It's too much debt in the system. <laughs> there's only debt in the system, and. Um, just as we're coming out of COVID, just as we're learning a number of things about how things operated, long-term effects of lockdown, long-term effects of children with mask wearing, yada, you know, how did the schools really perform? We all know the answers. No one did, really did great in any of this. Um, that's starting to come. Then we, we, America, pushed, pushed, pushed Putin pushed him. We had Zelensky go on the stage and say, oh, I'm going to get nukes in here at the Munich uh, Security Conference. We, I really truly think America is culpable in this. We push this. Okay, boom, we have something. I can see the, the migratory issue, the refugees. I, of course, I, I see this. And that's the crisis. That is a huge crisis that we have not, if it's really 2 million people, this is, this is the biggest story of the decade, how much work has to be done. I'm not hearing that. What I'm hearing is um, news here in the U.S. using it. Now it's all political. Now it's because of Trump. And, you know, and Trump loves Putin and all the Republicans love Putin. And, and you know, and you need to, whatever you say, you can be, you don't have to be anti-Russia, but you have to call Putin evil. So this is now, this is political, which means they're not serious. They're not serious. This is about politics. Uh, and that really pisses me off because I can't really know what's going on, boots on the ground. I hear that there's nothing but air assaults, yet I don't see it. I see rubble. We know that, you know, Kharkiv, which sounds like Kiev, eh, it's someone over there, I guess. It's really on the eastern border. That has been going on for eight years. So, you know, is this rubble shot from today, from three weeks ago? I don't know. So we're not being given any real information. And meanwhile, look at the real weapons of war that they are applying. And if they can take away some Russian oligarch who lives in the UK, can take away his, his football club, um, his, uh, you know, uh, confiscate his plane, confiscate his boat, confiscate his houses, who's next? Yeah, that's, that's what you got to worry about. It could be, you, it's going to be the podcasters next. Well, we, we know... We know anyone. It's insane. Yeah. We and, know. We're, and we're all like, yeah, go get him, motherfucker. No, this it's it's illegal. It's not according to any law. Well, I think so. Th there's a couple of good points on that. I mean, when you talk about Roman Abramovich and taking away his football club. Well, he, I, he I they think, didn't take it away. But well, you know well I, mean. He, I mean, he tried pressure, to sell it. Pressure. Uh, yeah. And I think the really tricky thing with Roman Abramovich is that um, allegedly, because he's not been convicted, he has a, quite a criminal past. Uh, he, he, he is an oligarch. So does the Biden family. Oh, I, I know. <laughs> we can come to that. But, but the, the, the oligarchs pillaged the Russian state, mm -hmm. and it's essentially a mafia. Uh, but we as the UK, we welcome the oligarchs into London. Yes. We allow them to buy football clubs and property, mm -hmm. knowing full well their history, and now at the point where we're upset with Putin... We now confiscate everything. So there's a there's a hypocrisy there and a chain of events that doesn't work. What actually should have happened, because uh, if you believe he's a criminal and a money launderer, then prosecute him. Yes. Prosecute him at the time. Don't welcome him just because yeah. he's there to spend money. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm not going to defend Roman Abramovich because he pillaged the Russian state and all the oligarchs did and they, they took away the resources and the money from the Russian people. And I, I don't support that. But I also at the same time say you can't have it both ways. You can't enable, you can't enable at this at a time because you want to tax him and sell him property. But let's uh, just talk about the, the basic concept of the rule of law. Yeah. That's that's how we're supposed to live. You got the Magna Carta, which is yeah. fuzzy in some areas. Yeah, very. <laughs> so we took that and we did a, a, a 2.0 version and we got freedom of speech uh, and religion and right to bear arms. 
And rule of law, a country ruled by law, not by men. And we've, we've really lost the plot on that here. And what's interesting is we'll just write new laws, <laughs> you know, or issue an executive order, which is of limited lifetime, you know, because no president is in more than, more than eight years. And it's, we usually switch around. Um, but this willy-nilly, it's my favorite phrase of the week, this willy-nilly business, that's got to have people terrified if you intellectually think about what's going on. I mean, I, I'm telling you, Elon Musk shutting off the Teslas in Russia, it's completely thinkable he would do that. And, we, and most people would not think twice about the fact that he can do that. They're like, yeah, that's great. Freeze him. Yeah. It's, it's- and ultimately, Peter, I know lots of Russian people. Both, I've been to Moscow, both here and in Russia. Uh, I know Ukrainian people. I know British people. I mean, do we really, we, never, but with today's communication, do you really harbor any on animosity towards any group of people, any country? <laughs> of course not. And, they, and I don't think... Tottenham, Tottenham supporters. <laughs> it's about it. Valid. <laughs> but, you know, th- 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 that's my point. It's yeah. like, why are we letting, why, what is the point? It, okay, so it's only because this, we've been told, and there's no other history to it, there's no 2014 Maidan, uh, the same people, Victoria Newland, back then John McCain, Lindsey Graham, all these people, uh, John Brennan, CIA, they were just coincidentally there for the coup uh, and, and recorded on phone uh, discussing who they were going to put in the, in the government to glue this together. We have to forget all that and just see there's horrible atrocities and, and that's all we care about. And we need to just focus on that because that's what we're being told to do. Yeah, and that's it. This is like my that's issue. That's so with, short-sighted. I know, and these sanctions. I mean, I'm ah. I have limited experience, understanding. Thank you, Jeremy. Thank you, sir. Um, but my history and understanding of sanctions, whether it's what's happening now with Russia, what's happened with Venezuela, what happened with Iran, is they never really affect the. They take some power away from the people in charge, but they never quite take away domestic power. It's only international power. But what it does is de- decimates the opportunity for the civilians of that country, the 140 million people in Russia. And so here we are. Yeah. Here we are. And what's happening in Texas is a great example of this. Um, I don't know if you've heard of the uh, the Beef Initiative. No, tell me. The Beef Initiative. So my job in, in this, first of all, let me just tell you what I'm doing. Yeah. Uh, anyone who's millennial, older millennial, I am here to mentor, help, do anything I can to make your life better because I think my generation fucked up. And I wasn't paying attention who was in city council or who was on the school board. Those were just losers who couldn't get a better gig. And I was having a party, 80s, 90s, making money, having a good time, family, you know. And then you wake up one day and like, holy crap, what is going on in our cities? What is going on in our schools? And how political is this? How many people do you need to run something this poorly? And so this needs to be changed. I do not think that we can fix finance education, uh, medicine, um, well, those are the key ones, uh, security. I don't think we can fix those with the current institutions. They have to collapse onto themselves. Uh, that's starting to happen. You're seeing um, c- the CDC, the, which only two years ago was the gold standard of communicating to the American people about health issues. Yeah, they, they, they really weren't prepared. They don't know how to do this. It's not the right agency. Because a lot of fuck-ups happened. A lot of fuck-ups happened. A lot of bad advice. A lot of advice based on data that was dodgy that they're now you know, admitting to. So no one will get in trouble. The faceless CDC is going to collapse, and they'll create something new. Um, what is happening is we're in a in in a way the globalists are going further in globalization we're deglobalizing so we're creating our own networks and by that simple form uh, activity pub mastodon you know our social networks we've shored that up and that will that will continue um the free the true freedom of speech the ability to just say what you want and have people hear it uninterrupted that's podcasting my yep. job is to protect podcasting. Thank we, you, we, by the way. We, thank you. We can get into what that means because we have had to do some work and still have work to do. There are guys my age coming out of retirement, like Texas Slim, who was sixth generation up way up north, and he says, our children are eating shit. I mean, <laughs> as, we, as we munch on a Starbucks. He yeah. says, 
And he, he is, has developed a concept called food intelligence. And he is an analyst, and he has quite a background in this. But he also has been a, a rancher with his family for all these generations. And he has seen and knows how all the – there's only a few processors who process beef, um, uh, animal protein, let's put it that way. And they are all, all moving towards uh, soy – and, uh, and other you know, vegetable or a plant-based uh, fake meat, fa- uh, a fake meat protein. And it's much more efficient. It's the plan. I can prove it to you. Everyone's moving in this direction. Ultimately, with climate change, green initiatives, they will make beef... Uh, the enemy. Not, ju- not just the enemy, but also unaffordable. Um, and, uh, and I believe it's to keep us just well enough to keep functioning and you'll actually, be, it'll be monitored all the way from the source of the food, all smart monitors, carbon credit calculations, how much you should really pay for it, how much you consumed of it. All of these things are going to be connected because that's really what they want. This is the technocracy. But let me just tell you before you talk that I, I spent two years as a vegan. I've got a really interesting perspective on it. Um, what happened was my mom got cancer. And uh, she researched every single thing to do. And she cut out sugar, meat, and alcohol. Mm -hmm. And that was just something she read and she got super healthy. And so I went vegan with her. But at this time, it was at the time my company collapsed. So I took a year off work and I would source all my veg and I would cook everything. I got in great shape. I was very, very healthy. Then I went back to work and I started moving from cooking all my fresh own meals to having substitute meats, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. sandwiches, pastas, and and I, I got I essentially got ill. I was tired all mm-hmm. the time, sure. headaches. So I went back to eating meat, and I was fine. Uh, I'm not anti-vegan. I think you can do it if you have time to prep and look after your meals. Mm-hmm. And I fully support anyone who wants to do it. But the substitutes are terrible. They are, and they're and they're very bad for you. And they're filled with all, I mean, I, I just learned that DSM, Royal DSM in the Netherlands used to be a chemical company when I was growing up. They are now the world's largest producer of soy and plant-based protein products for color, taste, and texture. It, it's all fake. It's all phony. So, uh, of course, in principle, I agree with this. And, and Slim was saying, hey, look, even, you even got to go back to the source of the seed of the grass to get the right stuff you need mm-hmm. that you need for your body. And he's just a believer in animal protein. And I said, look, can you show me something compelling? What, what really will show me that I should be eating beef really straight from my rancher? He says, look at these pictures. This is my family. This is my family throughout the years. Texas, not a great place to grow vegetables, but we get by. These people have been living for six generations on animal protein. How do they look? And he says, now look at a picture of some people from Houston, some people from Dallas, some people in Austin, obese. And he says, of course, you need to stop drinking, you know, pure sugar uh, from, uh, from McDonald's. Uh, but when you go to pure animal protein, it just works very well with our bodies. And that was, that was very convincing for me. So what he has set up and continues to set up is these is networks and this is what we have to do networks just like mastodon you know it's open source one thing is starting to bind us all and that's bitcoin because because that's a network everyone understands you know you don't have to speak the same language but you speak bitcoin i'm good with you right i already know who you are i know what you're thinking i know enough about you so now ranchers are accepting bitcoin in payment uh, uh through um uh, from people directly. They're setting up their own processing centers. Texas is unique. You can actually do that. You can process without the US uh, DA getting involved if it's your own uh, product. And now we're putting together distribution. So we will have food for people who are in the network and who uh, can find us that will be available because it's going to become unaffordable. It's on its way very quickly. Education, same thing. Um, we have many new small schools. Uh, people are grouping together. They're finding they're finding each other online. What, uh, the, what the fuck is going on with education here in the U.S.? I, I'm following lib, libs of TikTok on Twitter. Well, same thing with health. Is that is that uh, making is that making it look like the problem's worse than it is, or is there a crisis in education? Because I was like, all I'm seeing is all this stuff about gender and sexuality being taught mm-hmm. to kids, and I'm like. I know what my kids are being taught. Uh, they they have to do sex, sex education, 
but it's one small part of a biology class. But, this, the, but, but, this, but I, I want my t- kids taught math, science, history, geography. Mm-hmm. It seems to be this huge reading, agenda. writing, arithmetic. Yeah. <laughs> like, and I think I think I think sexuality and, and those things are, t- are taught in the home. Yeah. But there seems to be this real push to teach these. This things. is what we were talking about earlier. Yeah. This is what they want. They want everyone to I to be an identity, and then instead of meritocracy, you get equity. So everyone it, everyone always goes to the next grade. But the the students who look a certain way, believe a certain way, love a certain way, they will have certain privileges over others or not. I mean, that could go either way. But it's based upon your identity. This is what they've been putting in there. But do you think that it's, it's malicious or incompetent? It's completely malicious. And it comes from the money. It comes from the same with the, with the pharmaceutical industry. The, the big universities that teach, all of them, they have endowments and they come with strings attached. Here is $2 billion from the Oppenheimers or from the Rockefellers or whatever you want, whatever big rich family, the Rothschilds, you name it or even the royal family of the Netherlands. It doesn't matter, someone with lots of dough who has an agenda, and the agenda is always the same. So we're going to give you this, but you can only use this to hire people to do critical race theory or, um, you know, or only uh, talk about um, uh, diagnosing and prescribing pharmaceuticals. You know, we're not putting any, no money for alternative medicines, no money for uh, different types of education. It has to be this curriculum. And that goes into the universities, and and it's everywhere. Um, and the universities teach this. And then now we're at the point where these university students over the past 20 years, they're now teaching in schools, and they're teaching exactly what they were taught at the university. That's why healthcare sucks. It's a, it's a big scam. And when we had the allopaths versus the homeopaths, you know, all the money went into the allopaths. Like, okay, and, you know, so who also owns all the drug companies? It's all the same the same groups. I don't want to say people, but same really rich families. It's who owns the central banks. It's all the same people. Their agenda is to not have too many of us, to have ways to keep us under control, and for us not to revolt and go steal their shit. That's basically what it is. And the, and the more I look around these days, it's the more I see of it. But I see the incredible opportunity. A lot of people are going to escape the, the misery. Well, it's happening. It is. We're going to escape it because we have a Bitcoin connection. We have a true, honest network that we, it's the most basic form of freedom of speech, really, well, to, I th- to spend I, money. I think the interesting point that you said on that is like, oh, if I know you're a Bitcoin, I, I understand you and mm-hmm. I know you. And there can be differences. Look, I'm certainly a little of bit more, more on the left than. Uh, than certain Bitcoiners, but at the same time, we know there's certain principles that that you hold. But, and I think the interesting thing about that, it's not just that you hold Bitcoin, you've done the work to understand time preference, and you've mm-hmm. done the work to understand the economy. And what's been really interesting is this kind of exit from the system that people like you're talking about. There's big pushes f- to move to ho- homeschooling. There's big pushes to change with, diet. With off-the-shelf open source technology, by yeah. the way. Michael Saylor's been providing some of that as well, hasn't he? I've not, I've not yeah, seen yeah. that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I can't remember his website. But but there is that, it's, there's like this push and pull between decentralization and centralization. Uh, and and uh, rather than sometimes maybe fighting people on the big stage, the best thing is to set up these smaller communities and help people and let them understand. What we're learning is that in the age of Warhol's 15 minutes of fame for everybody, the biggest audience is not advantageous anymore. It doesn't bring you riches. It doesn't give you bring you wealth or health or any of that. It, it makes you really a target, if anything. And this is the kind of the whole fallacy of, of social media. We're still stuck in this old paradigm where you have to have the number one ratings to be the best, to be the king of everything. Those days are just over. I mean, everything is, has been bifurcated, split. Uh, there's too many channels of everything. So what becomes valuable, back to networks, is your network. Mm-hmm. So for 15 years, I've been building my own network, which we call Gitmo Nation, which is everyone who uh, listens to or belongs in one way to the No Agenda Show podcast. And this network, we've facilitated that with things like our own Mastodon server, with a complete open sourcing of the entire, in fact, we don't even call our our listeners, listeners, we call them producers, and they actually do produce. So we have thousands of of people with expertise in one particular area uh, feeding that back to us. And they, by themselves, started to self-organize into meetups, even set up a website, noagendameetups.com, 
every day around the world, there's at least a group of eight, but sometimes 80, who are getting together. And it's completely separate cultures, sexualities, ages, genders, everything, but they have one thing in common, and that's no agenda. Um, that's the same with Bitcoin. That's why Bitcoin meetups are also something you, you need to attend. These networks, that's where the value is. And when people see value in the network, they will be attracted to it. That's exactly why um, it's so interesting to watch what's happening with Swift, because right now, I mean, yeah, they can go to some Chinese network, but that's not where the activity is. The economic activity is in the SWIFT system. Um, so can something be built up alongside of that? Well, maybe, but it will take some time. So when you have a valuable network like Bitcoin, that's only going to keep attracting people. And it just made me think the European Union just proposed legislation. Uh, Failed. Well, what was interesting was the, you know, we... It initially was like, hey, we got to stop proof of work cryptocurrency. Then it was like, well, the way I'm reading it, how can we use this so it's a little more efficient? Because everybody now knows it's the perfect solution to these bullshit renewables that, you know, don't work at certain times. But when they do work, we can solve that because if they're overproducing, instead of shutting them off, let's make some money with them. So that's kind of what I read. It's like, oh, we should, because they, they're, they, they're hedging. Everybody's looking at Bitcoin and going, let's not completely shut it off. Let's not entirely get rid of it. And, we, and, we have, and that's not because they want to be fair, Peter. God, no, that's not. The, the, the real problem is stable coins. Excuse me. Stable coins, by definition, are inflationary. If it's, if it's just a pure representation of the dollar and is used as such, it's an inflationary instrument. That needs to be regulated. Totally agree with that. Yeah, it's um, the 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 proof of work in Europe is super interesting at the moment because we are certainly seeing the U.S. in large areas, especially in Texas, embrace Bitcoin. I mean, Texas is Bitcoin country. Mm -hmm. uh, we were just at Amchain Capital yesterday. My, uh, my friend Parker Lewis's company, and he's done so much work here to push. Any guy named Parker, I love all the Parkers in Austin. Yeah. We have about three of them. He is <laughs> fucking smart, mm -hmm. and he's he's been pushing that here. But I'm generally seeing. There isn't a huge appetite to actually ban Bitcoin now in the U.S. I mean, the yeah. SEC wants to regulate all the shit coins, but we're not we're not seeing that, which is super interesting. But when I saw the EU propose this, I was looking at the U.K. government and thinking, well, you've left the EU for a reason. Mm -hmm. You now have an opportunity here to push free money, to push Bitcoin, which you can't defeat. There's an opportunity here to become the European base of Bitcoin innovation. And they're just not taking it. No, but they are America's bitch. Cool. The American banks rule the world. I know. And, and, you know, I remember in 2010, I think, I remember my, my banker buddy comes from Deutsche Bank, and he left to, for his own health and family, I believe. But he knows this shit very well. He said, we won, we won. I said, what do you mean we won? We won. We fucked all the banks everywhere else. We won. Because we're, we're we basically own all of them after that. I mean, we gave trillions of dollars to every single bank, Bank of Scotland, Bank of Japan, everyone got money. Um, you know, they had to pay some back, but it's it's, irre it's all irrelevant. We won. And, and it took me a while to realize, 10 years really, for me to realize that when you're in the financial system in America and you're part of it, it is, it is like second nature. The money printing is second nature. Um, and Whenever we go through this cycle here in, in our Congress, like, oh, we have to raise the debt limit, which means we have to be able to print more money, or the yeah. Federal Reserve has to be able to make up more money, create money, um, then there's, it's always a political football. But ultimately, everyone says, well, we all know that we can't actually not raise the debt limit. Well, we know that. Why is that? And that's because the Federal Reserve always talks about 2% inflation per year. That's their target. With that, they're not talking about how expensive your, your loaf of bread is. They're talking about how much extra money they're going to create. And that is such a given, and people don't understand it, you know, that every year, by definition, your dollar is going to become 2%, worth 2% less, just by definition. We, we had, who, who was it we had on who explained inflation to us? Uh, Cullen, Cullen Roche. Cullen Roche, yeah. Yeah, so just one, one thing on that. He, he, ex he explained, yes, that does happen. But he said there are other factors that drive inflation. Uh, it can be it, Supply, economic of growth. course. It can be all but, kinds of stuff, sure. But the thing was... But I'm just saying, what is inflation? Is the definition inflation the way it's brought on the news? Is, oh my God, 
everything's getting more expensive. I'm talking about inflating the money supply. Well, so, but the, what I was going to add to that is like, I, I'm not an anti-government person. And I understand that government sometimes they, they, they need to run a deficit. They need to, they need to print money to fix parts of the economy or, or, you know, during tough times, but they used to run a surplus as well. There used to be that balance. Nobody runs a surplus anymore. It's always a deficit. But back when they used to run surpluses and deficits, okay, 2% inflation, but you used to be able to get 3 4 5 6 7% interest in the bank. Mm -hmm. So you could protect yourself against that. There used mm -hmm. to be the uh, better opportunities for pay rises. Yeah. We're fortunate with the career we do. But like I know, for example, I th there was a big fight in the UK for the nurses to get a pay rise. They eventually yeah. got it. It's way below inflation. <laughs> so it doesn't matter that they got it. Yeah. They've got less money. So we're we always laugh here in the $15 an hour minimum wage. We're like, dude, it should be 25 If anyone agrees to that, you're getting screwed. And of course, oh, $15 an hour. No, you're being an idiot. But isn't that exactly the problem? The yeah. money is being taken away from you. And we all know what will be the, I mean, in 2009, I saw um, a whole bunch of presentations at a financial conference about vaccines and how this was the future. We're going to cure people before they're sick. And, and I was talking about it on my show back then. And, you know, it's like they're, they're up to no good. They, they, they're more interested in the money than in the health. And, you know, talking about a vaccination against cocaine addiction. I was like, what? How can that even be? Whatever. That's how nuts it was. But they were really talking about mRNA technology and other things, gene editing, CRISPR, all this kind of stuff. Conspiracy theory, nut job curry. Here we are. They've actually done some of that. For better or for worse is irrelevant. They're doing it. So <clears throat> when we talk about a central bank digital currency, that'll never happen. We are, I think we're getting very close for that very, very reason of what's happening with the SWIFT network and mm -hmm. what is the next version of the economic network and what will it be based on? You know, people are talking about we have to move to a commodity-based currency. All I see, logically speaking, is if if you want to fulfill the 2050 carbon neutral um, agenda, which means no more petro then you are killing the petrodollar. The whole system is based upon oil and oil-based products being bought and sold in U.S. dollars being cleared through the New York Fed going through our money system. That's the whole reason why the dollar can be used as the reserve currency, why it's relatively stable, and why we can print as much as we want. So that is all government's goal is 2050 net zero. So at least by 2050, the petrodollar will be out of business. So, I mean, is, am I, is there something well, illogic here? No, no, because... It's, ba it's backed on the fact that oil is priced in dollars. And we've seen, don't sell oil in euros, Gaddafi, we will kill you. Well, so we had, uh, do you know Alex Gladstein? No. He's from the Human Rights Foundation, uh, big Bitcoin guys, just released a book actually called Check Your Financial Privilege, which uh, we need to get a copy, Danny. Um, he's been on the show a number of times. Uh, we just uh, covered the economics of war. Um, we did a show about the petrodollar mm -hmm. with him, and he said one of the things that never came up uh, for discussion during the Iraq war was like, it, there was obviously a lot of people were wondering why we did it. It was based on false information or lies, whatever, whatever your choice is, but I think we all know we were. It was to save the Bush family's money. Well, so he said, at the time, Saddam Hussein wanted to move to buying and selling their oil with mm -hmm. the euro. Mm -hmm. So he, he said he said that there's every chance this war was to protect uh, the petrodollar, yeah. especially as when uh, you saw as soon as they invaded, they immediately uh, started protecting the oil fields oil and the uh, mm -hmm. the whatever that institution of. Uh, Oil is within Iraq, the central whatever. They they immediately central authority. Yeah, whatever that central authority was, or the oil, the oil ministry, mm -hmm. they they, they yeah. immediately protected that. Yeah. But the, what it's making me think, and what I'm wondering is, I, I don't know who we ask these questions to, Danny, but I couldn't understand why they cancelled Russia and confiscated their their foreign reserves because they essentially killed the the treasury bill, mm -hmm. and they essentially therefore destroying the 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 petrodollar but is there is 
I mean, it, I might sound like a conspiracy nut myself, but that's okay. I'll, I'm it, a conspiracy therapist, so I'll help you through it. Therapist. I'll help you through no, it. I'm just wondering: is is there an incentive to kill the petrodollar mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. because they want to kill the power of uh, of the oil producers? I think it's much, much bigger than this. Okay. Um, You're going to get me some <laughs> nasty emails now. Come on, no, let's do it. No, I mean, we we have to fix I'm, – I'm going back to finances, follow the money. You can, you yeah. know, they need to fix the financial system. So when the elites, the banking elites – of the World Economic Forum. These are not slouches. Yeah, it's a drinking club. Klaus Schwab is an evil looking guy. You know, ha ha ha, he's, he's really just a PR guy. But the people who really are meet in Davos, and I've been following that for years, it was a, it's, a, it's a financial conference. Um, they want a great reset. They want a reevaluation. And this is where it gets Hold on, we want a great reset as well. Ours is just different. No, of course we do. Of course, well, we'll take advantage of their great reset because I think they will try to reset and revalue the big RV, the reevaluation of all currencies across the board, bring them down to the same level based on probably gold, which Russia has amassed an incredible amount of. And China. And China. Russia, Putin in particular, the one thing, I don't believe he wants to restore the old Soviet Union to its old glory. In fact, I've seen him say quite the opposite. And the quote I've heard him use is, I've seen translated as he used it, whatever that means in authenticity. Those who do not mourn the Soviet Union's passing are heartless. Those who want to restore it are mindless. And I think he's right about that. And I believe that that's his actual thinking. The one thing he's always hated was the the dollar priced oil. So for him, it would be super advantageous. Look, Russia may be in on this. Just, I'll go conspiracy theory for a second. So we we weren't able to really collapse the world with COVID. And okay, I'm going to go big on this. Why? Because we were supposed to have Hillary Clinton as our president. We were supposed to be locked down for at least three years while they developed a vaccine. Trump did Operation Warp Speed. Again, just conspiratorial thinking. Who gives a fuck? We're, We're drinking coffee in Austin. And he says, okay, maybe 2% of people will die unnecessarily from shit we haven't tested yet, maybe more, maybe less, but it won't be the whole world locked down and dying inside their houses. So that screwed things up. Trump screwed things up a lot for the agenda because a lot of this was clearly already planned, even going back to the planning for some type of event, some type of uh, biological event. So now we're coming out of it. No one can really hold it anymore. Um, Now we have a war. Now we're just going straight for the financial system. You cut it off. I mean, gold, if it was really valued at what it should be, it's, it's, you know, there's a lot of paper gold out there. It would probably be $30,000. It would probably be close to Bitcoin. Um, I really think they're going to try and equalize it all. And so... You know, the rupee, the lira, the, you know, uh, the ruble, the dollar, the euro, it'll probably come to some equilibrium based on a gold standard, but then they're going to implement CDBC and, you know, and that's how you will each manage your own economy, not by necessarily creating more, but by removing it from the citizens, by uh, marking payments, uh, you know, it's like just like you'd have these Sato- if, if we're Bitcoin, these Satoshis are marked and you can only spend them on food. You can't spend them on alcohol or cigarettes. That would be the control they want. And, and they're not bashful about it. That's the thing. All of this is being said. The Bank of International Settlements, the CEO, the big fat fuck, he literally <laughs> sat there. I mean, the guy's really obese. <laughs> he is a big guy. He literally, you saw it. He's I like, yeah, guy. you know, it's like, yeah, we'll have, the, you could program this money. That's much cooler. Yeah, we want money programmed too, but we're programming it so that we can exchange value for value in real time. And just about that, <clears throat> what we developed with Podcasting 2.0. Yes, let's get into With the streaming sats and the boostograms and boosting and all this stuff. That is, that is giving people a taste of what it's like to live in a real Bitcoin economy, real value attached to it, value, time preference. It's literally based on time preference. Like every minute I want to send 100 sats that I'm listening to this person. Okay, I want to go back a step. Jeremy, do you know who Adam is? No. He essentially invented podcasting, kind of. 
Kind of. I don't know. Dave Weiner and I invented it together. I know. I don't actually know the background. I've only heard uh, Rogan call you the podfather. Yes. And thank you for it. And we. No, all... I, I thank him because he recertified me. Uh, Jeremy over here didn't know who the fuck I was. Yeah. He still he didn't even watch Rogan. Still doesn't know who I am. Fuck's sake, Jeremy. <laughs> no, uh, I, I, Simmons. What? Simmons, the uh, sports podcaster. They call him the podfather. No. Yeah. Yeah. No. I've, I've, I've you know I've heard all kinds of people this. saying the pod. Ricky Gervais actually uh, tried to steal that. This, he had a series, this didn't is, he? This yeah. is the pot. This is the yeah. actual podfather. So I've By heard. By the it- way, Rick, that's a fl- that's very flattering when Ricky Gervais like I'm gonna take I'm gonna nick this from Adam Curry. I'm like, okay, Ricky Gervais, you're my hero. Go for it. Back, back off, Ricky. Uh, <laughs> no, but so I've heard him call you that. But I, I actually don't know the or- origination story. Oh, I'll tell you. We okay. want to hear it. Okay. Um, in 2000, I, uh, I, le- I left the United- went back from the United States. I took taken my company public, had a little bit of cash, moved my family back. My wife is Dutch, and she wanted to be close to her family. And at the time in the Netherlands, we had cable modems, which was, was fantastic because um, the Netherlands has a lot of cabling, not a lot of antennas and, and stupid wires. And uh, now you could keep your computer on. There was no more dial-up. <clears throat> Jeremy, do you remember dial-up? Yeah, Fucker. <laughs> exactly. So you didn't have to do that anymore. You could leave your computer on, but the speed was shit. Yeah. So um, I thought to myself, what if there was no experience in multimedia? You you click something, it would download for ten minutes, and then would have to open up a player and yeah. you know and for a three minute video, if that. And what if you had a little thing, a little program running on your computer that knew had had to go get something that you wanted. And it did that behind the scenes without telling you, downloaded it, and then said, oh, there's something new. You wouldn't know that there was a 10-minute wait because you weren't notified. So that time is not, you didn't lose any time in your mind. You weren't waiting for anything. And um, Dave Weiner at the time was doing uh, blogs. He really created uh, web blogs. And he created the RSS standard, which allowed you to subscribe to a blog post. Yep. And so I flew to New York and said, I want to explain what I want. I think I think we can make a cool multimedia experience if you can give me like the equivalent of an attachment on a, on an email. Now, he probably thought, no, I know he thought I was some Hollywood douchebag guy. And he, I came back the next day and tried again. And I had now programmed it in one of his, his uh, programming languages. And, and he said, okay, I understand it. I'll do it. But only if you promise me you'll never, ever use my software again. Because that was horrible what you did there. I said, like, good. I'm glad <laughs> I don't have to do that. So that was 2000. And we were using this back and forth. Really, we were the only two guys using it. So he'd upload a 100 megabyte video. And in the morning, I'd go in. It was already on my computer. Click play. I had an experience. Then I saw the iPod. Boom. Boom. I was like, that's a radio. That's not a jukebox. That's not a digital Walkman. That's a radio. It looks just like the one my grandmother gave me when I was seven. A little Sony AM transistor radio with a nine volt battery. And... I hacked together as Apple script because I'm not a programmer and had some help from other people, thank goodness. And um, so now I could upload with a blog post a show, it wasn't called a podcast, and it would download to my computer and then you still had to sync your, your iPod with your computer. Then it would sync it up, put it into a playlist, and there it was, the first podcast in a playlist. And right away, <clears throat> I started doing a show called The Daily Source Code, which was intended for <clears throat> the one thing I never thought I'd have to do is I, I had now I had to find people to build radios because you needed the app. There were no apps. And so this daily source code was about the development of the apps. And we had the iPod or Lemon, the Xpotter guys, and we're all kind of building these apps for Mac OS, uh, for Mac OS and for, um, uh, for Windows. There was no smartphones either. And um, then it just went <laughs> further until 2000 five or six and steve jobs called me and says you can i have a chat i was like just steve Jobs." yes yeah, so, yeah. nah maybe thursday <laughs> and uh and yeah i sat with him for an hour and really it was great i mean i could talk about that forever but it, his pitch was i want to put podcasting and itunes Are you okay with that I said, well, yeah, yeah. i'll give you the directory now so that's really when podcasting broke open wide <clears throat> and the mistake I made, although I, how could I know at the time, was I made Apple the default on-ramp for podcasting. And that was fine. They've been great stewards of podcasting. They've done nothing to enhance it, <clears throat> which again is fine because they, they make no money on it. But then they started fucking around with the API that everybody was using. And they were just changing things and they were taking shows off and deplatforming. And that's when I called 
my other friend, Dave Jones, who I'd been working with for 10 years, and we've created a million products that no one ever used, said, I think we have something to do here. We need to take back the index, <clears throat> create podcastindex.org. Um, we're calling it Podcasting 2.0 because we're going to add features now. So the first thing we did is <clears throat> we now have pretty much every podcast that's that's actually a podcast. Doesn't, doesn't have to be active, but not, you know, one show, two minutes of someone saying poop. And believe me, there's a lot of those. Are we there? We are. Nice. Yeah. Oh, yeah, of course you are. <laughs> um, and we have over four and a half million now. Wow. But because, and so now all these app developers didn't have to rely on Apple. They could turn around. We offer the API for free. We now have 15 or 16 apps in some more established, but even Overcast uses us to some degree. We have uh, working on 20 features, chapters, transcripts, um, uh, person, ge uh, geolocation, seasons, all the stuff. Everybody, we just unleash this big cork of creativity. It's all open source, open project. Set up a Mastodon server so people can communicate. That's been the best. Um, of course, we have GitHub and stuff where people get a little more, <clears throat> a little more technical. And um, and we added because I'd been messing around during lockdown with the full node Raspy Blitz. I'm like, oh, this lightning thing. And then I discovered Keysend. I'm like, holy shit, I can broadcast money. I can broadcast money. And, I can, and, and, and you'll receive it whether you have your radio on or not, your money radio. That's how I mm. look at it. That's how I look at everything. I said, well, then we can do true value for value, which I've been doing with Dvorak for 15 years. We don't ask people to subscribe to anything. We say, send me whatever you think the show was worth. So you just sat here for an hour, or you listened to us for an hour and a half. You could have gone to the movies, taken a date, had some popcorn, a Coke. Might have been 50 bucks. Were we worth 50 bucks? Time preference. This is why it all comes back to mm, Bitcoin. Yeah. It all comes back to that. So now we have the same method where people are just, literally people say, this is the most fun I've had parting with my money. So a couple things. They're seeing that it's money. They're had, they have to make choices. They have to make choices now. Do I spend this? Do I give this money to my favorite podcaster, um, knowing that it could well be worth twice as much in three years from now? What is that? So this, all your time preference stuff comes into play. And people really value what they're sending. It's not just willy-nilly. Second time the Friday to use that. Um, and then all kinds that people go so far to the value, they actually, they disassociate from the underlying asset. So now it's a row of ducks, 2,222 2, sats. Um, we have a rush boost, 2,112, if you know anything about rush. Um, uh, you know, you name it, every type of, uh, you know, the 420, uh, I mean, all these different types of things, including this per per minute payment, which of course you utilize on your podcast as well. Have so, you seen the helipad bit though? You probably don't have, have that yet. No. We Do you know about that. the boostergrams? No. No. Yeah. See, this is, we need communicate. So we, we have developed now in the apps, if you look at any 2.0 app, newpodcastapps.com, yep. you can set your streaming amount yep. per minute and then there's a boost button. So you can just send a thousand sats or you hold it down and you can put in uh, a message, a short, kind of like a... Oh, is this a bit like on YouTube where people... Super can, chat. Yeah, yeah exactly. super chat. Yeah. Except, oh man, there's so much beautiful shit in here. Yeah. So of course, it's going directly from that listener's wallet to the podcaster's wallet. There's no one in between. No one can stop it. No Patreon who's going to deplatform you. And on your side, we now have an app that you can load up. We've made it available for Umbral and Raspy Blitz, and we're getting more out there. And it's a whole listing. You can see all of these boostograms with the amounts, what people are saying. People are now tying that in, literally putting it on their on their website so people can see. You have leaderboards they're making. Um, and what we've built into this is a distributed digital royalty system. So <clears throat> in your show, in your feed, or even for an individual episode, you can determine as many lightning addresses as you want with the percentage you want going to them. Okay. So um, you could say, I'll take, you know, uh, 60%. Uh, <clears throat> you'll give these guys each 10. You know, maybe you give, you give your guests five. We, now people are giving their guests 5% of the split. And so when someone is listening and they're streaming in real time, or if they hit a boost, you're making multiple payments all to those people individually, uninterruptible, 
completely transparent. Everybody knows what he's getting. I like that. And now people are using that for albums, putting putting and uh, putting the band members in the splits based upon writer, composer, producer, um, contributor, or whatever it is. It's this, and this is a true use case of economics at work, which I think is almost unparalleled in Bitcoin world right now, except for point of sale stuff. Yeah, yeah. I love it. I mean, fuck these guys, but giving some to the guests is pretty good. It, you know, some guests say, um, uh, I want uh, 10% to go to, uh, I think, uh, actually, the Human Rights Now, I think they have a, a lightning address that you can, that you can plug in there. Certainly and you do. can do it, you, you, don't, you don't have to ask permission, you know? But like, uh, we'll get back to the podcast and 2.0 stuff. Like, just for you, just to see this huge explosion of podcasts and what it's become, it must be like an unbelievable thing to see, to be there from the start, to now see some of these podcasts have got the biggest media properties in the world. I mean, this pod, podcast has changed my life. I I podcast because of Rich Roll. I don't know if you know him. No. I met him during my vegan time, actually, run, mm -hmm. running. And he's got a very successful podcast, changed his life. And I, I just said, I want your life. <laughs> How do you do this? I mean, sort of, this is exactly my point, though. Yeah. I don't know this guy. I've never heard of him. Not interested in what he's talking about. You just said he has a very successful podcast. Yeah. I don't care how you measure that. That's success. I love that. That's that's where we need to be going. That type of success. But but what do you make of this growth in podcasting? Because I think it, podcasting for me is now the most important uh, media channel in the world. It's it's where you, like no, for the because no one controls it, brother. Well, it's that, it, but they, they do a little bit. No, if you no. have an exclusive deal with someone, they might take some shows off. That's not a podcast to me. Okay, okay, that's a fair point. But tw Twitter becomes a problem because it's low friction to follow someone, and, and anyone can follow you and just start giving you shit. If someone makes the effort to listen to a, an hour, two hour show, they care about what you're doing, which was what I was thinking about earlier when you talked about your community. That's something we've not done: is build a community around our show. But actually, that's probably better to do than try and build a community around Twitter because it's just it's a shit show. But but I think podcasts have become the most important medium because you have to spend time having a conversation, even if you disagree with them. I don't. I haven't agreed with everything you said today, but we have a conversation, and it makes you think, and it makes you go back and consider things. It's saying the people listening in. But what is it like for you as an external person to see this? Because you spawned a multi-billion-dollar industry. Mm -hmm. It must be just fascinating to watch. I am, I am living the happiest days of my motherfucking life. I am so, I'm elated at what's happening. What you just said, I mean, that that is truly what makes me, I mean, I, I could, should, I'm 57, you know, I should be maybe thinking about retiring. I'm, I'm doing four shows a week. I'm doing more shit than ever. I'm doing, it, showing all aspects of me. But to see what the the a, a generation younger <clears throat> really millennials what they're doing with it where they're taking it how they're understanding how to build community i i, I really want to stress the uh, fuck twitter mastodon we've had our instance of, we cut it off at ten thousand. that's all we wanted because it's, it's a lot to manage but you can federate so anybody can manage their own little community everybody can come in you can create your own rules it's very bitcoin like and that has become a very high signal to noise ratio versus Twitter, which is the inverse. And once you get past the, oh, but no one will see it, well, of the bots and the trolls and the fuckwads you don't need in your life anyway. Yep. Many people have dual accounts. It's not crazy. People have Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. You add one, maybe one goes away. But people start gravitating towards this, there's no algos is really the main thing because there's no profit motive. So <clears throat> you're not constantly triggered with a conversation that was triggering coming back, coming back. It scrolls off. It's like, you're done. That is just kind of done and it, and it fizzles, fizzles on. Danny, put Mastodon on our to-do list. And you, you, can, okay. you can set up a Mastodon server, masto.host for I think five euros a month. But well, let me, to let answer me, your question yeah. though, fucking mind blowing. Yeah. Well, I, let, let me just tell you, just mom, for, for, for I some, made it, mom. <laughs> for some perspective, just so you understand, uh -huh. uh, at the time I set up the podcast, my company collapsed, my marriage mm -hmm. collapsed, and I was recovering drug addict. Mm -hmm. And you I got the trifecta, bro. Everything was shit. Mm -hmm. And I met this guy, Rich, and I saw his life, and I was like, I'm going to start a podcast. And I hadn't, didn't have much money, and I just made this effort go around with my little case with two mics, a Zoom H6, mm -hmm. and I started interviewing people. Mm -hmm. And in the space of four years, it's absolutely changed mine and my family's life. 
it now is a thing whereby we book two. We, we, I mean, I travel the world. With, I've been to forty countries with the podcast. Four, mm -hmm. Forty countries. Uh, I've been to Venezuela, and not Greece, just and Asia. not just staying in in posh hotels. You've been in migrant camps and crazy ass shit. I've heard, I've heard you. Yeah, but now we're at the point where we go. So here we've come to Texas for a few weeks. Uh, Danny flies in from Australia. Jeremy flies in from Philly. I fly in from Bedford. I we drove come, in from Hill Country. You drove in from Hill Country. <laughs> guests guests fly in. We've got this. Rather than one little tiny case, it's Jeremy. How many cases do you bring? Eight. Eight. Dude, eight you cases? need a carnet for all this shit at this point. I mean, that's like. Uh... We get to we get to create this content. People appreciate it. People have started podcasts because of my podcast. Yes, uh, I, yes. It's impacted my children's life. Like the, the this podcast virus has been yeah. the most positive virus in my life, my friend's life. Danny dropped me an email one day and said, "Can I do your audio?" And I said, "Yeah." Now he travels the world with me and does this. It's changed all of our lives. But, so but thank that, you. Uh, no, thank you for just seeing the vision of it. What's so be the reason why it works is because of its simplicity. And we'll just start with the... the and integrity. Yeah, it doesn't work without integrity. Nope. Uh, and civility is in there somewhere too. That's what Tony Khan from WGBH, who brought NPR public media screaming and kicking into it. He's very visionary. He says it's the civility here because, first of all, we don't employ a lot of tricks. You know, you had your, your Zoom H6, you had your two mics, you know, but you could have used that. You could have had a whole truck with it. It doesn't matter. You, you can podcast. You could have recorded on your phone. And then the simplicity of an RSS feed, which at its core, any, anybody who can read can look at this and go, I kind of understand what's going on here. And I, I kind of see what has to happen because, you know, it's in English. It's called really simple syndication. All you need is a text editor, an MP3 file, and a server to put it somewhere. And you're podcasting. And then... And then and you can take on CNN. Oh, you but, can but CNN is... This is, this is the, the, the joke of it all. If you look at absolute numbers, CNN is nothing compared to... Our two shows together would kick CNN's ass for three days in a row. Cumulative. But it's, it's you know, we're still coming out of the the throes of, you know, whatever the, the mainstream media was. That takes decades sometimes, but it's going really fast. You know, the 30-year-olds the today, they don't have cable. They're not watching CNN. You know, they, they, they'll watch some stuff on YouTube. What's sad and what we have to get people out of is the, the melatonin addiction or the, the yeah. melatonin, there's uh, serotonin, uh, all these different chemicals that are firing in your brain when you get recognized, get liked, get retweeted, get, you know, whatever it is, positive comments. And now we've gotten to the point where it's a game. It's gamified whether you're going to get kicked off or not. And we're now focusing more on, oh, can I say something? Oh, I might I'm, 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 I'm get kicked off of YouTube. I get kicked off to Twitter, blah, blah, blah. Oh, you oh, I can't believe you did that. You're going to get kicked and they forget about what they were talking about, really. Yeah. That, well, that's just kind of gone away. And it's so polluted. It's I know. polluted. The, it's the, the one, river of vomit. The one thing I'm I'm worried about, and I'm, I worry about myself, but broadly as well, is audience capture. There is a real risk of likes, downloads, uh, at, uh, clicks, retweets, of, of you getting captured by your audience. I, I think the best thing mm -hmm. is always to talk to as many people you disagree with as you agree with and try and push yourself. I felt the tug of audience capture. I can. There's, I know there's certain tweets I can put out about Bitcoin. It's going to get ten thousand likes. Yeah, yeah, but like, I think it's very important to just try and avoid that because if we do make that mistake, I think even podcasts, some podcasts, can end up making the same mistakes as mainstream media does, whereby they're also driven by this this similar incentive model of advertising. Therefore, they want to get their downloads up. Therefore, they absolutely back into the corner of their audience. To, to me, podcasting is really the, there's no wrong way to do it, but it's the antithesis of advertising media. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> if only for the reason that you can fast forward through the commercial and mm -hmm. you can fast forward through this. So what's the point of it? <clears throat> have, have, you ever, it have you ever looked at the numbers though? Because it's quite surprising. The no, one time, sure. Do a lot of people listen anyway? Yeah. So mm -hmm. uh, the one time I looked, it was a long time ago, only 20% of people fast forwarded through the ads, which really surprised me. Only 15% of people fast forward through our donation segment. Interesting. And I think because it's content, yeah, um, people are feeding something back. 
Um, by the way, to the value for value model, transparency is, an, is a key point. So we, we thank people and tell you how much they gave us. You can sit there and count and see how much we got. Mm-hmm. We've never cared. I, by coincidence, I found out we had about 1.4 million listeners to the No Agenda show. Just for, it was a small window of time. We could actually track something accurately because of the index work. But I've only cared about, can I pay my rent? That's all it's ever been. That's all I ever said. I, I can pay my rent. Great. We've got another good show to go. Um, with my stance on Russia and Ukraine and not showing the compassion some people are programmed to expect, I had many people say, I'm never going to never gonna send you value again. You've ruined it for me. I'm, I'm never going to listen. Well, that means all- it's working. Well, it's it's how it's supposed to work. Yeah, it's how it's supposed to work, and that's good, you know. And and I've refunded people money too. It was like you were that pissed off. No, let me give you your fifty dollars back, please. Absolutely. This, this somehow there's something in our um, in our human psyche, our psychology that makes this work, that makes us want to interact. And if anything, everything that's being built around us, certainly from big tech, is meant to fuck with us. And and I mean. These are not secrets. Yep. Um, my God, this new filter on Instagram, which is now nonstop, the, you know, how I look beautiful filter, which is just every, every guys, are, everyone's using it. I don't know. I, I must be just weird that way that I think that can't be good that when you look in the mirror and see your real self. And what is that doing to your image, to your self-worth, all of this shit? Well, Jonathan Haidt studied the impact fantastic yeah. books he's written fantastic yeah. i mean books, my yeah. daughter is not allowed instagram for that exact exact reason she's upset about it but it's like what i'd like is when it comes to education every kid their parents should give them an old laptop and a linux uh distro and install this <laughs> and then when that's set up set up a mastodon server i'll help you punch the hole in the firewall at the, at the cable modem and get on that with your friends start there start to get an Umbral, I think that not Umbral specifically, but yeah, the category, because you have Start9, Umbral, Raspberry mm-hmm. Blitz, but Umbral, you know, even the, the ready-made Bit, Bitcoin machines box, which of course I had to have one in orange just because like, oh, this, I've been waiting for this. It's so cool. And it's not so much that you have uh, a full node and you have a lightning node, um, but also NextCloud, you know, and click, NextCloud is there. Oh my God, it's everything I really need. It kind of does all the things that Microsoft Office or any of these full-on productivity suites would do. And with the benefit, once you figure out how to work in this brave new world, you can actually go somewhere and talk to the guy who made it yep. and say, hey, bro, <laughs> let me buy you a coffee tip, you know, lightning invoice. Um, this, I've really been looking for something like this. Is it possible you make that? And you know what? These guys actually answer. So, I mean, this is the, this is when we figure out that we can have the products we want built the way we want, we might figure out that we can elect politicians we really want. <laughs> we have to go through this process, I guess. Yeah. Well, listen, man, honestly, thank you so much. Uh, as I said earlier, podcasting is. Uh, changed my life in so many unbelievable ways but my family and you changed your life brother you well, changed i did but like just the medium having it it has for all of us we, we were we were watching the denver nuggets last night with jeremy classic um, classic uh, um, jeremy had not seen it we we were we were supporting the philadelphia 67s weren't we <laughs> the what 67s <laughs> we're winding them up uh, but uh but we were watching it last night and we were all saying like we get every six weeks, we get together for two weeks and do this. And and it's just, we all get on the play. We all get excited. We get here uh, and we sit down, we discuss the shows, we have some whiskey and we spend two weeks just doing the best job in the fucking world. So uh, thank you, brother, for what you did to create this path because it, it's genuinely changed my life. And I, I really appreciate you. And now seeing you smash it with Bitcoin as well, I think is truly amazing. So just from the bottom of my heart, thank you. Well, thank you because, you know, you are one of many people who have helped me understand truly what Bitcoin is. That's, that's my what, guess. Sorry? That's my guess. <laughs> well, I've, I've formed my opinions from multiple people, but <laughs> I, I like a lot of what you're saying. Also, to be very fair, I like the ads on your show because I'm like, oh, shit, I, I actually want one of those. <laughs> Relevant advertising that way is very exciting to me, so I don't want to discount that. But thank you for... Um, uh, for continuing to propagate the message, both of podcasting and of course, Bitcoin. 
and inspiring people. Because, you know, I, I don't think you're that much younger than me. I hate to say it, but how uh, old are you? I'm 43. So you're catching up. Catching you, nearly there. But there's still, I look about the same age. There's, <laughs> there's still people 10 years uh, behind you, and they need all the help they can get. We're going to go through very, very bumpy times, mm -hmm. uh, and, and creating, maintaining, and securing these alternative networks is super, super key. And thank you for uh, bringing some more color to Texas. We love having you here in Texas. We think you should move here. Uh, if you want to get married, you know, I can find someone appropriate. Shotgun wedding. I, 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 I would be down for that. I'd <laughs> like me a nice Texan woman. Okay, listen, if people want to find out more about podcasting 2.0, by the way, we made a show about that a couple of years ago. Yes, so go and check that out. That'll be in the show notes. Um, but if, where, where do you want people to go? Uh, podcastindex.org. If you're a developer, if you're a listener, if you want to get started right away, just see what it's like. Go to newpodcastapps.com. Uh, you can find, immediately you'll see all the podcast apps that use it, what kind of capability they have. You can also look at hosting companies that have capabilities. That's really the main place to go. All right, man. We'll keep crushing. Thank you. Thank you so no, much. No, thank you. Thank you guys as well.